we begin, and I'm not going to uh, engage in what might be kind of a traditional <laughs> debate uh, format here, only because I, I was uh, the captain of my high school debate team in the, in, uh, the early 1960s in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's been that long since I uh, actually engaged in those kinds of debates. Although I do recall that, uh, and, and in those days, and I assume it's still it's true in high school, you had the same topic all year long. And, and you just collected, you, you would go back and forth on the same topic. And my senior year, I remember, was should the United States adopt a government-financed health care system? <laughs> and it is ironic that here we are, uh, many, many years later, debating the same topic. But uh, that's not what we're talking about tonight. It is sort of unusual, though, that I'm here tonight uh, taking, the, uh, taking the affirmative side of the, of the case, looking at uh, whether or not global zero would make the world more secure, because, again, uh, referring to my, my past, but updating it to the 1980s, as, as some of you in this room will remember, and there are some people in this room that are as old, if not older than I am, not many, but some, uh, will remember that I was frequently sort of dragged out of my office in those days in the State Department to go on television to make the case for building more nuclear weapons, making the case for nuclear deterrence, and, uh, and fighting the then very, very energetic and vociferous anti-nuclear movement uh, in the United States. You'll remember um, the, the famous freeze movement, movement among others, some of you will. And, uh, and in fact, there was probably one of the most watched made-for-TV movies of that era uh, the day after, which had, by the way, a big impact on President Ronald Reagan. Uh, really, I think, crystallized the kind of anti-nuclear uh, 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 movement, not only in the United States, but uh, elsewhere and, of course, particularly in Western Europe. So wh how is it that the guy that made the case for nuclear weapons uh, in that era is, is here to make the case for Global Zero? And there are two possibilities. One is that uh, I've suddenly fundamentally changed. The scales fell from my eyes. And I've now uh, had this uh, moment on the road to Damascus and seen, uh, seen the way. Well, that's not what I'm going to tell you tonight. My main argument tonight is that from the end of the Cold War to the present, the world has fundamentally changed in some very important political, military, and technological uh, ways uh, that particularly for the United States and U.S. interests, would make uh, our country and, and other countries uh, more secure if, if Global Zero could be achieved. Now, I am not going to argue tonight that we're going to achieve it. Uh, I'm not going to argue tonight that it would be easy. I'm not uh, going to argue that, uh, that anybody in this room is going to be alive, as President Obama has said, probably by the time it is achieved. Uh, that's not the issue we're debating. We're not debating the issue of feasibility. I think we're debating the issue of desirability, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. And the first key point I would make is that, uh, and I'll do it in shorthand because I want to stay within my 10 minutes, uh, is there has been a fundamental shift in international relations and the nature of conflict from the end of the Cold War into the 21st century. And there's more than one of these shifts. Uh, one, one is that uh, we are moving from an era, I would argue, of the dominance of geopolitical power into a period of geoeconomic power. Now, what does that mean? It means that uh, the great powers of the 21st century are going to be seen and judged and have influence principally in terms of their economic capacities, not so much in terms of their military capabilities. And the reasons for that are, I think, that people have learned lessons from the experience of the 20th century and perhaps some of the close calls of the uh, Cold War period 
to recognize that for the most part, interstate warfare has become uh, 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 no longer really cost effective. And what's, uh, what's interesting to me is we kind of uh, survey uh, military conflicts around the world today. Uh, you, you can't name many really ongoing or potential interstate conflicts. What you can point to is a, no a number of intrastate conflicts, uh, like the ones underway in Syria, like the ones still underway uh, in Iraq, like the ones underway in, in Libya. So the likelihood, uh, it's not entirely ruled out, but the problem of international security, especially for great powers, is going to be one of dealing with intrastate conflicts and not interstate conflicts. And power, as we define it, increasingly into the 21st century, is going to be defined in terms of economic wherewithal the BRIC countries, the Chinese. Yes, there's a military buildup underway in China, but what people really are concerned about and what is going to be a game changer for China is the fact that its economy is going to be larger than the United States sometime in the next 10 or 15 uh, years. And so uh, I, would, I would argue that today, the most important strategic dialogue underway between and, and relationship underway between the United States and Europe is no longer NATO. NATO has kind of become an artifact, a relic of the past. The most important process underway today is TTIP, the opportunity that the United States and Europe, the two, still the two largest economic blocks, are going to have the opportunity, if they can reach a trade and an investment partnership are going to be able to set the rules of the road for trade and investment for the rest of this century. That is a key strategic development. TTIP, in my view, is the new NATO. Now, part, as I said, part of this reflects, I think, a shift from interstate warfare to intrastate warfare. And the result of all of this is that the political and military advantages conferred by nuclear weapons, especially for the great powers, and I want to underscore that, the United States, the former Soviet Union, Russia now, uh, China, Britain and France and others, is dissipating. They don't get that much bang from the buck as you used to from having nuclear weapons. And that is, I think, largely because the existential character, the threat posed by nuclear weapons in a time of the Cold War when there was a realistic chance of conflict between the two superpowers is gone. What is the likelihood of a war today between a major war where nuclear weapons would be employed between the United States and Russia? There I can just quote my old adversary in the bureaucracy, Richard Pearl, who's been quoted recently saying, it is zero. What is the likelihood of a conflict uh, that would lead to nuclear war between Russia and China at a time when they're growing closer together, they're members of the, of the same kind of security organization, they're doing energy deals together, the Russians need to sell their energy, and that's what makes them a power today, not their nuclear weapons, but their energy resources and China. Zero. What is the likelihood between a nuclear war between China and the United States? Would China nuke the United States when we owe them so much money? It's zero. And I would argue the same, the same kind of probability also exists. I won't want to go off tangent here, but even take a case of a country that feels itself under great threat, Israel and its nuclear weapons. I understand completely why Israel acquired nuclear weapons in the 1960s and, 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 deployed them in, in, in the, uh, and deployed them in the 70s. That, that was against an Arab threat that they defined in terms of superior Arab conventional forces, Egypt, Syria, uh, Jordan. But Israel has has conventional preeminence today in the region. The threat, the key threat that, that Israel faces today is, again, from groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, 
Now, how do nuclear weapons solve that threat? They don't. They're not a reasonable, uh, they're no longer a reasonable military solution to the real threats that Israel has to address. So that's the great powers and the role that nuclear weapons used to play. But there's another development we now have to think about that's, that's vastly different than the problem we faced in the Cold War. And that is while great power nuclear threats have become, for a variety of reasons, anachronisms, they have become a much more interesting option for weaker states. Nuclear weapons, which were used to be the, the weapons of the strong, are increasingly becoming the weapons for the weak. Nuclear technology is no longer cutting edge. It has been around for over 50 years. And as North Korea and Pakistan have shown, anybody who has the necessary money, energy, and will can get a hold of them. The result is that while traditional great powers get decreasing value out of having a nuclear arsenal, smaller and weaker states see greater value in them. They are levelers. After the Gulf War, this famous quote by the Indian Defense Minister said that the main lesson of the Gulf War was, if you're going to go to war with the United States, you better have acquired nuclear weapons. And people said, in the case of Li the recent Libya campaign, gee, if Qaddafi hadn't given away his nuclear technology, would the United States, Britain, and France have attacked him? That's a good question. The end results could be very bad of this trend for both international security and stability, and in particular, the United States. Now, for international stability, now Kenneth Waltz, who, uh, of course, uh, uh, has, has passed, argued in a very provocative uh, book that a proliferated wor world, that is a world where a lot of countries had nuclear weapons, that world might be a lot more stable. Now, I understand the argument because you'd have all these little deterrence relationships going on, but I reject it. The problem with that argument is, I just, was, can, is just one word, look at Pakistan. Here's a country with a vigorous nuclear weapons program, one of the most energetic and vigorous in the world, a country with a Taliban, a, a radical, a, uh, not just one, but several different radical Islamic movements, a government that uh, has, has had a, a suffered a breakdown in civil military relations, arguably one of the most combustible, dangerous, radical countries in the world, I think the Kenneth Waltz argument falls apart. There, I would not like to see 30, 40, 50 countries uh, possess nuclear weapons. Maybe the United States and the Soviet Union, who had the command and control and necessary security, and even there, as you all know, there were some close calls. But I can't conceive that a world of 40 or 50 nuclear weapons would somehow be more s secure. But the implications for the United States right now are enormous. Unlike the 1950s and 60s when NATO deployed nuclear weapons to compensate for our perceived conventional weakness in Europe and the great uh, Soviet Union and a Red Army, we possess conventional preeminence today in the same way that Israel p possesses it in, in, in the greater Middle East. Why would, why would it be in our interest at a time when this technology is obtainable to see several new countries become nuclear powers and thus be able to deter us from using those conventional forces to protect our interests? So I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, in this new era, when we do possess uh, unchallenged conventional capabilities and conventional technology, which is precise, discreet, and can, and can be used with much less collateral damage. Uh, in drones, just for one example, uh, the idea of, of, of nuclear proliferation is very dangerous. So my conclusion. We do need to strengthen the NPT. It is very much in our interest to stop the spread of nuclear weapons.
we should support initiatives like uh, the Obama administration's nuclear security summits. And we should aggressively seek further reductions in nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not a dreamer. And it's just because of Russian military weakness and conventional weakness that they don't want to negotiate at this point. And I, and I guess if I were in their position, I probably would uh, take that position as well. But there, I would argue for them, in the long run, that's a losing game. Because what's interesting to me is the, is the, 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 the leading Russian military figure uh, in response, and this is about six months ago, some of you will remember this, in response to uh, NATO's uh, missile defense program, argued that, well, if this program continues and it, unabated, that uh, we're going to have to think about deploying, f de forward deploying, what was it, SS 21s or 23s in Kaliningrad. What was interesting to me about that threat is it hardly made it into a single American newspaper. You know, if, 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 the, if the chief of staff of the Russian Armed Forces had made that threat in the 1980s, it would have been on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post. And why did it make it in a newspaper? Because nobody takes it seriously. Nobody thinks that Russia is going to attack Europe with nuclear weapons. And that, I think, makes my point. What we need to do is delegitimize uh, nuclear weapons proliferation and continue to support, as this administration has, the long-term goal of Global Zero. I apologize for the fact that CSIS moves into this new building and still has inadequate audiovisual. We should have at least three mics because we have three people who are going to speak. Um, I want to say a few words about the role and value of nuclear weapons uh, during the Cold War because I think there are still instructive lessons for us in the post Cold War era and into the 21st century. Uh, nuclear weapons are horrendous weapons in terms of their destructive power. So horrendous that they changed the way human beings reacted when they were in charge of nation states that had nuclear weapons. Um, the Cold War ended. It's remarkable uh, and it's historic first that the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, an ideologically driven war, ended without nuclear weapons being used. It also ended without a major war between the United States and the Soviet Union. We know what a world without nuclear weapons looks like because we had one. It had World War I in it and it had World War II in it where you had 20 million casualties in World War I, 50 to 60 million casualties in World War II. Nuclear weapons inhibit the risk-taking propensity of the leaders of nation states. Pakistan and India have gone to war twice, but they haven't resorted to nuclear weapons. They were able to back away from the Kargil incident. You've had horrific terrorist incidences supported by Pakistan take place on Indian territory, including an attack upon the national legislature. But the possession of nuclear weapons in that particular bipolar situation inhibited both the Indians and the Pakistans from reacting to it. Nuclear weapons made the leaders of those nuclear weapon states cautious and afraid of breaking the threshold. Uh, now I wish that interstate, interstate violence was over. It is true there has not been an interstate war since the Cold War since World War II between, you know, the most developed countries in the world. But we're also in a situation now where we, as some have argued, we are in a second nuclear era where the kind of sectarian, the kind of, of local conflicts that we see now 
are going to start appearing in a nuclear context. Um, Israel sought nuclear weapons in the 60s and the 70s for profound reasons. Well, Iran is seeking nuclear weapons today. And that's something that concerns the Israelis, that concerns the United States greatly. One of the reasons why Iran seeks nuclear weapons is for the same reason, as Ambassador Burke said, U.S. conventional preeminence. Of course we're preeminent. We don't want anyone else to have nuclear weapons. We've already indicated by our own behavior that we are deterred by nuclear weapons. We invaded Iraq twice to prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon. Why? Because if, as the Indian Chief of Staff recommended, don't fight the United States unless you have a nuclear weapon, well, Saddam Hussein ended up strung up by the neck in a basement someplace in Baghdad. Gaddafi met an even more grisly death. Well, that's not going to happen to North Korea because there's one thing that's absolutely true in terms of the historical record. You have a nuclear weapon, you don't get invaded and occupied. And that motivation isn't going to go away. It's not going to go away for France, that looks at nuclear weapons as integral to their sovereignty. And it's not going to go away for North Korea, and it's not going to go away for other regimes who face threats, including perceived threats from the United States. So that the desire the need that states feel to have nuclear weapons is not going away. In fact, I believe it's getting worse. And I think, you know, there has been a nuclear taboo they've referred to since Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but it's not really a taboo. It's a rational calculation that the costs associated with a nuclear conflict far exceed the potential advantages of a war that involved the use of nuclear weapons. And this is going to continue. Ambassador Burt referred to the fact that the world has fundamentally changed since the end of the Cold War. Well, the Perry Schlesinger Commission, which was an attempt to come up with, uh, an attempt to unify, to come up with a comprehensive consensus in the United States for what it should do with its nuclear weapons, concluded that the vision of a world without nuclear weapons could not happen until there was a fundamental transformation of the 21st security environment until the kinds of conflicts that exist today no longer prevail. And it's not just an Arab-Israeli conflict, it's also a Sunni-Shiite conflict. How many of us think that an Iranian bomb won't be followed by a Sunni bomb? Of course it will. I think at this point I'll stop. So at this point, we're going to have questions. So Ambassador, you can ask Clark a few questions, and then Clark will be able to ask you a few questions. Did I misread that, that it meant I had five more minutes? I thought it was cut it off. But that's all right. Throw it open now. Okay. I didn't even see her before. I probably went over, but OK. But I'm like that. Uh, am I supposed to ask questions? Yes, you can ask Clark hey, some questions. Well, Clark, I mean, you've, you've, what you've said is, you know, this process of proliferation is, is just going to continue to happen. You say that the, you know, you not only have the Arab-Israeli conflict in the region, but you've got a Sunni-Shia conflict, and that there are all kinds of reasons that other countries might acquire nuclear weapons. But remember, we're, we're okay. I, I, I see those 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 processes underway. I mean, you see them right now in Syria. But I guess you know, going back to what we're debating here, making the world more secure. I mean, are you, are you just saying that, that 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 we should sit back and just watch that happen, and that's a that's going to be just inevitable? Is that a good thing? Do we want to see that just happen? As the world's most powerful conventional power, you know, my boss, Les Aspen, when he was the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, used to say in, at the end of the Cold War, if there was a big button that I could press that button and all nuclear weapons would go away tomorrow, I'd press that button instantly because then that would leave us with no capabilities out there that can deter us 
but it's our conventional power itself that is one of the prime motivators. There's a reason why Russia is more dependent upon its nuclear weapons now than it was during the Cold War, because they are weak conventionally and they are relying more on nuclear weapons, and the threshold of nuclear weapon use is probably um, getting lower with respect to Russia. They've already talked about um, they've already talked about how they would use nuclear weapons for escalation control. Well, for most of us, I think the use of a nuclear weapon indicates a lack of control of escalation during this time. And so I think that the motivation for states to acquire nuclear weapons is getting stronger in many instances, and that when you have an era when the Chinese, for example, are engaged in substantial uh, military modernization of their nuclear forces, when asked why they're doing it, they're doing it for precisely the same reasons that we in the United States say we can get rid of our nuclear weapons. That is, they're concerned about what we do with missile defense. They're concerned with what we do about advanced conventional munitions. They're particularly concerned with conventional precision strike, all of which are capabilities that in Global Zero reports, they say, we need to do more with our conventional forces so that we can reduce our reliance on nuclear weapons. Well, it's precisely that that makes other states increase the reliance on nuclear weapons to offset our conventional superiority. And so it strikes me we're in a situation where the reality of it is that nations seek nuclear weapons for many different reasons. Sometimes it's a form of national self-expression. I think you see that with India. I think you see that as well with Iran. It didn't matter whether you're part of the current regime in Iran or part of the opposition movement. The Shah himself also wanted nuclear weapons during that time. So that the reasons why nations pursue, you know, are first of all national self-expression. They also do it for defense. That's why the North Koreans have them. That is why regime preservation. That's why the Pakistanis have them. Because they are next door to a very powerful country that they are conventionally inferior to. Nuclear weapons aren't going to go away. Uh, and if they're not going to go away, we have to figure out how we use our nuclear capabilities in a way to stabilize things and to pursue our interests in a way that is safe for Americans. Okay, well, there are a lot of issues that you raised there, but uh, you, you didn't uh, address my question on, uh, you know, whether it would, it, it's, you know, we should sit back and relax and watch these countries as they inevitably will acquire nuclear weapons. But I don't want to go back to that. I don't, you, I'm not you, relaxed you, about you it. Argued, I'll do it. You argued in your opening remarks that, you know, that, uh, that in a sense nuclear weapons really sober people up. That, you know, it was a good thing that uh, the United States and the, and the Soviet Union had all these nuclear weapons because they were afraid they didn't want to blow up the world, so they were very cautious. And that, that could well be true. That's exactly what I used to argue. And in the Cold War period, I think the nu nuclear weapons did play an important role in terms of deterring a conflict, which was most likely to take place in Central Europe. But we got to draw a line somewhere. I mean, when, when nu when, when what happens when totally irresponsible, fanatical people get their fingers close to the button, and that's a key issue. I, that's why I raised Pakistan. I worry about the security of the Pakistani nuclear stockpile. That is a country that is melting down in a variety of different ways, and we know, we know, this isn't just uh, hypothetical, we know Al-Qaeda has tried to obtain nuclear weapons. There have been several efforts that have been documented. Now. Do you think that if Al-Qaeda acquired nuclear weapons, that they would be as responsible as the U.S. Command Authority or the Soviet Politburo was? Of course not. I mean, that, that it, in itself, I would argue, is a bit of a silly beside the point question. The issue here is, do nuclear weapons go away? Mm. Walter Pincus. That's not the issue. No, let me finish. Walter Pincus, in an op-ed just this morning, and this is uh, an analyst um, who'd look for any occasion whatsoever to reduce the number of nuclear weapons. So this morning, it was sequester, another opportunity to reduce nuclear weapons. 
But then when he said, you know, the question was asked, as he was talking about what to do, he said, go to zero, forget it. Nuclear weapons aren't going to go away. And as long as nuclear weapons exist, the United States has to ensure that it has a safe and reliable nuclear arsenal. That's the same position that President Obama takes. That is, as long as nuclear weapons exist, the United States has to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear arsenal. Well, I don't see a world in which nuclear weapons aren't going to exist. And if that is the case, then we have to invest in our own capabilities and ensure those capabilities. Okay, I got one time for one more question. You, you, you did talk about Iran seeking nuclear weapons. That, that is not, by the way, what the U.S. intelligence community has decided at this point. But I don't want to get into that argument. What I want to talk to you about, what's so bad about, given your argument, what's so bad about Iran acquiring nuclear weapons? Why should we worry about that if we know Israel has nuclear weapons, we know Iran has nuclear weapons, won't that create deterrence in the Middle East? Won't that be stabilizing if Iran acquires nuclear weapons? First of all, it's not at all clear that Iran can achieve nuclear weapons without a great deal of violence and instability within the Middle East. Because, you know, our president has said, well, that's a red line for us. And the Israelis have said, that's a red line for us because an Iranian nuclear threat, an Iranian nuclear threat poses an existential threat to uh, Israel. So the process of that proliferation is hardly a stabilizing effect. Now, as to what would happen in the region itself, my feeling is, is that an Iran acquires a nuclear weapon that will begin a cascading process of more proliferation of more nuclear weapons in that area. Um, I don't see Iran going nuclear without Saudi Arabia following closely. Yeah, but, but, you, but you just said that's how countries behave. What's wrong with that? No, I'm saying they, that's how countries, why, why countries acquire nuclear weapons because they serve their interests. And as long as nuclear weapons serve vital security interests for states, there will be states interested in pursuing them. And the wow. case that you mentioned before of both Gaddafi and of uh, Saddam Hussein is proof positive for many of those states. Yes, if we had a nuclear weapon, uh, we do not have to worry about say, if you're North Korea, about the United States coming up and invading Pyongyang and hanging Jong-un by the neck until he's dead. That's what nuclear weapons do. They provide a mechanism to ensure regime survival. And it's one of the reasons why nuclear weapons won't go away. And if they won't go away, we're back in the dilemma, as President Obama puts it, as long as nuclear weapons exist, the United States has to, uh, has to have a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. To me, when you said before, I don't want to talk about the feasibility of a world without nuclear weapons. I want to talk about the desirability of a world without nuclear weapons. Well, you can't talk about the desirability of a Nirvana state that'll, that is not feasible. Now, Clark, do you have questions for the ambassador? Oh, I think we've gone further enough along. I'm ready for questions now. Okay. Well, then, do you mind if I borrow your microphone for a second? Right. Only if you ask him a question, not me. Uh, before we turn it to the audience, I just have one question, kind of the same question, but for both speakers, uh, phrased differently. So, Ambassador, if, let's just say that Global Zero isn't feasible. I was just hoping that you could discuss right. what measures do you think are important for the United States to take in the short term to mitigate some of the threats that you discussed. and. Clark, I was hoping that you could discuss what measures short of global zero you might support to resolve some of the threats the ambassador discussed. Well, I, I never said that it wasn't feasible. I, I just don't see it feasible in the foreseeable future for a lot of reasons. I don't want to get into the breakout issue and the verification problems. I, but we've looked at this very carefully. But uh, what I think we should try to be is on a path to zero at a time when, as I think Clark has very eloquently pointed out to us tonight, there are a lot of incentives for countries to acquire nuclear weapons. And I don't think it's in our long-term interests to see a proliferated world. And I think we can control it. 
He's talked about countries that could, could uh, acquire nuclear weapons. We ought to remember there are countries that have not acquired nuclear weapons that have come very close and decided for reasons that they thought were appropriate, whether it was Brazil in Latin America, South Africa, uh, the Ukraine. So, I mean, there are a lot of examples where, for various political and economic reasons, countries have not gone nuclear. On, on, on this, on this uh, you know, what, what I think we, what we really want to try to achieve here uh, over time is uh, a process of, of delegitimizing nuclear weapons, and that means there has to be, I think, a growing consensus am among countries that, uh, that you're going to run into serious political and economic problems if you try to cross that line. And Iran, to me, is a very good example. I think what has, been, has happened in the case of Iran is you have a very serious sanctions effort in effect. The Iranian people are feeling that. I don't think it was a coincidence that somebody like Rouhani was elected. I don't see him, as maybe Prime Minister Netanyahu does, as a wolf in sheep's clothing. I think that uh, there is a faction in Iran that wants to find a solution short of acquiring nuclear weapons. I think they're going to want a price out of that, not just lifting sanctions, but recognizing uh, what they consider to be their legitimate rights to uranium enrichment. And I'm not saying that we're su suddenly going to ha have peace break out there. But I, I, what I'm, I guess I'm opposed to what I've heard earlier this evening was this sort of idea that, you know, this process is out of control. We've got to recognize that it's going to happen. Nuclear weapons are going to spread. What I find very interesting is if that were true, if that were really true, we wouldn't be living in a, in a world where there were only nine nuclear powers today. We would be living in a world where there were 39 nuclear powers. There are a lot of oppositional forces at work, and uh, uh, there are a lot, there's a political and economic price to be paid for going nuclear, and I think because of our interests, we should try to raise that price rather than to, rather than to lower it. The question is, is what kind of actions would I be willing to take in order to reduce? Um, I think when estimating what the size of U.S. stockpiles should be. I think there's two very important elements because the United States nuclear weapons are not just simply for direct deterrence. I think the case is pretty solid that if the United States had new, new, no nuclear weapons, it would still be able to inflict catastrophic damage on anyone that threatened its security. But it's not just the United States that relies upon its nuclear weapons for deterrence, we have allies that rely upon our nuclear umbrella. That is still true in Northeast Asia, where we have two uh, non-nuclear allies, South Korea and Japan, who are having to cope not only with a more assertive China that is modernizing its nuclear forces, but also to cope with a new nuclear power, North Korea, which has demonstrated that by crossing the many red lines that previous administrations, including this one, had put in front of it, nevertheless went nuclear, and is enjoying an independence and an autonomy of action that it did not before during that time, is that they need the assurance that the United States provides with its nuclear forces uh, to deal with the security situation in their region. Uh, we have a Russia that's more dependent upon nuclear weapons, a Russia, uh, a Russia that, uh, uh, that engages regularly in nuclear exercises, that practices, um, uh, that practices uh, nuclear exercises and the making of threats. And the Eastern Europeans are quite anxious about many of the things that Russia does. There's a reason why NATO 
uh, three times in the last five years has reaffirmed its support for the forward deployment of U.S. nuclear weapons uh, in NATO Europe. Uh, so that the reliance upon U.S. nuclear forces extends beyond the United States, it also extends to its allies. At that note, we're going to shift to audience questions. Um, I'll call on you if you could identify yourself, and then if the speakers could just repeat the question into the microphone for sure. those watching um, over the video. Yes? Hi, uh, Will Yale from SICE. A couple questions for Dr. Murdoch. Uh, on the topic of you know, rogue states like the Ugarite and regime survival, in the extreme long term, couldn't we even say this is possibly a temporary phenomenon? And should we have a normative goal that sort of transcends the nitty gritty facts of the day? And in a related question, uh, about a year ago, I was uh, in an event with the uh, former American Studies Director for the Chinese Academy of Social Science and the former Joker of the Mao. And uh, I asked her, you know, is there any possibility of China ever going into some sort of nuclear talks with the United States over the stockpile? And she said, that's ridiculous. The US, the US and Russia have you know, thousands, and we have you know, 200 nuclear warheads. Um, and so isn't a first step possibly uh, you know, reducing our, our current stockpile to a reasonable level, even unilaterally, couldn't that be a uh, first possible step to bring in these other states into nuclear negotiations? And can you restate the question? As I understand it, there were two questions. One, couldn't there just be a normative goal of some kind that would, well, the thing about normative rules is that they have to be implemented and enforced and followed. And it strikes me that you can establish uh, a normative rule that says thou shalt not possess nuclear weapons, but the question is, is who's going to enforce that particular norm? Uh, who is going to, uh, for example, make the North Koreans give up the nuclear weapon that they've tested and are now developing? Uh, it's okay to have norms. That's what the vision of Global Zero is about, is a world without nuclear weapons of which as uh, my colleague says, we're trying to delegitimize nuclear weapons. So um, we can have a normative goal. The question is whether it's an operative or effective one, and I would argue no. Uh, in the case of, uh, of a norm that to me is counterfactual, because nuclear weapons do exist, and I don't see any, as, uh, nor does my, uh, my debating partner, see any feasibility for a world without nuclear weapons in the foreseeable future. If it's not going to happen in the foreseeable future, why are we maintaining that goal today and having it affect uh, the actions that we take today? The second question is talking with the Chinese, absurd to talk uh, with the United States at this time. And as you put it, if the United States would only reduce its weapons down to a reasonable level, well, what's reasonable? It depends on what you're comparing it to. For me, uh, when I look at the U.S. posture, I think two things right now. One, I want to maintain rough parity with Russia. Am I willing to go to lower levels with Russia? Sure. It depends on what kind of price we have to pay for it, because the Russians have insisted upon you know, some concessions with respect to missile defense that I'm not sure are wise, or concessions on advanced conventional weapons, which I also don't think are wise. But am I willing to go further down with Russia? Sure. Uh, but with China, my belief is, is that the United States has to maintain a pretty substantial superiority over China because of the dependence of our non-nuclear allies upon U.S. extended deterrence. If the United States and China were to achieve parity, I don't think our extended deterrence guarantees in Northeast Asia would be worth anything. In which case, the drive for both China, I mean for Japan and South Korea to resume the pursuit of nuclear weapons, which both nations did at earlier yeah, periods of their history, this question. might come. Can I also ask a follow quick follow-up? Let, let's, uh, let's see if anyone has any questions first. Don't worry, I'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling they'll 
Well, my answer is is that I never assume nations are going to act rationally. Uh, nations do a lot of irrational things. That's why I argue that a world without nuclear weapons would, would be more secure, because nations do screwy things, and they make mistakes. And it depends on how you read through the history of the Cold War. There were some very close calls. I mean, it wasn't until after my experience in the Reagan administration, and uh, I was, uh, some of you in the room know, I was very much involved with a very difficult and controversial deployment of, uh, uh, of INF missiles in Europe in the early 80s, the Pershing IIs and, uh, and the uh, ground launch cruise missiles. And the Russians worked themselves up into a lather about the Pershing IIs. They had decided that this was a wonder weapon that was designed precisely to knock out their command and control and that this was going to give us some kind of escalation dominance in, in the European theater. And they, there was a NATO, famous NATO exercise some of you may have read of, and if you haven't, you should, called Able Archer. And the Russians believed that the Able Archer exercise was the prelude to a, to a NATO nuclear strike against Russia. And this was in a very, very heated atmosphere of when we were beginning the deployments. Rhetoric was escalating. And what's fascinating to me is you go back and read that study, all you needed was somebody to make a bad decision. All you, you know, there is, there is a, there is a, now a cottage industry of people who have studied the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I'm old enough to remember watching Kennedy come on television in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you, any of you are fans of Mad Men, uh, uh, you know, the TV series, you know, that create, I mean, it, we, we believed, my parents thought that we were going to nuclear war. And there were a lot of people in Washington at that time who did. And again, there were some, there were some close calls, but these, these were two, arguably, two of the more sophisticated political establishments in the world. And that, I'll just simply say this, uh, because, of the, because nations make big mistakes, and we've seen a lot of those, say, in the last decade, in my view, in, in coming out of this city, uh, nuclear weapons are just simply too destructive. And if you're a real supporter of Global Zero, it's not the question of, you know, of, 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 of uh, should we do this now. I, if and when a nuclear weapon is used, and given what my partner Clark is saying about the cascade of proliferation in the region to Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Egypt after Iran goes nuclear and so on and so forth, there will be one used. And I can guarantee you, once one of those things are used, the, 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 it's not going to be a question of our government's going to act, but public opinion will act. Remember, there, there, were, there were how many people? 4,000 people killed in 9-11, but a nuclear weapon used in Delhi, used in Islamabad, used some, in some major city in China, used somewhere in North America is going to lead, I, I would believe, to not just a national but an international drive to eliminate these weapons. I want to return to the question of delegitimizing nuclear weapons. I believe that's what the question was about. Um, weapons are weapons. It's part of the human condition. We used to use really primitive weapons to kill each other. Now we use pretty advanced weapons of mass destruction to kill each other. The question is whether the weapon is illegitimate. It's the purpose for which weapons are used. To me, genocide, whether it's done with gas chambers or whether it's done with machetes, is abhorrent. It's the purposes for which weapons are used. Weapons themselves aren't legitimate or illegitimate. They just are. 
It's part of the human conditions. We've always used weapons. Um, we just passed the 68th anniversary of Hiroshima, uh, August 6th of this year. That's 68 years since a nuclear weapon has been used. Historically, we've not invented weapons and not used them. The destructive power of nuclear weapons is so awesome that it has inhibited, inhibited people's willingness to use them. Do I think it's more likely that a weapon will be used, a nuclear weapon will be used during the next 20 years than it was during the last years? Yes, for precisely the same reasons that Ambassador Byrd is talking about. They're proliferating to more irresponsible parties. You know, that uh, the trends uh, that have held forth since the end of the World War II are getting more and more remote. I think the likelihood of use is greater. But the fact of the matter is, is that for 68 years, we have not had a major conventional war. You know, World War I, 16 people died. World War II, 50 to 60 million people died in these conflagrations. Nuclear weapons helped prevent that from happening. Sure, there were some close calls, but we didn't have World War I or World War II. And I would argue that when you look at the inhibiting effect the nuclear weapons can have, they make our leaders more cautious. They make them less human, if you like, which is probably a pretty good thing when it comes to the use of weapons to pursue in the pursuit of national interests. Yes? Yeah? I uh, have a question for Ambassador Burke. Clark raised earlier that the very uh, conventional capabilities that the administration has offered to substitute for nuclear weapons, such as prompt global strike missile defense, are creating greater instability in the system. Do you agree with that? And, and if not, do you think the president has offered alternatives that are credible enough uh, now on the conventional side? I'm sorry, Sam Brand and CSIS. Well, that's a great question. I think he kind of wandered into that argument because I don't think he wanted to make it necessarily. but. Uh, I don't think it's so much the. Uh, the I got it written down here. But. Okay, I don't know. I don't think it's so much the new technology. Because I basically support, you know, uh, a lot of what I don't know en enough about to tell you the truth. And so I think it's a little bit weird the prompt global strike thing. I think it was sort of concocted as, gee, if we had had that when we knew where Obama was during the Clinton administration, we could have got him before he left you know, the village. But uh, so I, I don't, I don't want to kind of endorse prompt global strike. But, uh, but, you know, I do think that we've had a revolution in, in conventional warfare that has made conventional weapons more discreet, as I said before, less collateral damage. And, I, and, and we have a standoff capability where we don't risk the lives of our people. And, uh, and that, I think that has confirmed conferred to us uh, a certain political advantage. I don't want to over, overdo it. But even if we didn't have that stuff, you know, after the Cold War, we suddenly found ourselves, as you know, the French called us at the time, a hyperpower. And, uh, and I think there was a certain incentive for countries to figure out, but there, there haven't been many that have. I mean, I don't think North Korea in the final analysis has, has developed its, its nuclear weapons capability what, to the extent that it has it and a few bombs because it wants to deter the United States. I think they developed it as a way of blackmailing us and it's, uh, it, it'll, it'll end. They're an outlier. I wouldn't base my strategy on, what, on what, uh, what North Korea does. I think it's more how we use those forces. And when I said interstate warfare, I wasn't going to say this in my er early remarks. I mean, we're one of the last countries to realize that interstate warfare is not very cost effective. You know, I mean, we did succeed uh, uh, in kicking Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. But, uh, you know, our, the invasions, I don't have to tell this group this, the invasions of Iraq, you know, what we, you know, our, how our mission changed in Afghanistan, even now Libya and what it's become. And while there was a tremendous blowback that even surprised the president over, you know, using cruise missiles against Syria, 
is, you know, it just doesn't work that well. It hasn't been effective. And I think other countries recognize that. And that's one reason why I think there, there's, you know, the, the, the threshold for using military force, in my view, is, has risen because pe people don't get what they used to get out of it. And, and you know, when you talk about, when you talk about, you know, World War I and World War II and all the people that were killed and, gee, nuclear deterrence uh, prevented another war, as I said earlier, I agree with that in the Cold War context, but that's not the situation now. That's not, you know, the Germans do not feel threatened by the Russian Federation. There's, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're the, Germany is the largest investor in Russia. And we, you know, this, this community, and they're represented in this room, needs to really kind of change that paradigm and recognize that where power is in this world and how it's judged and evaluated. Maybe the Russian, the aging Russian establishment guys like uh, uh, Rogozin in Russia and the military elite still think that they get a big boom out of having you know, a military industrial complex, but nobody else in the world does. They see the demographic trends in Russia. They see the fact that the Russians have failed to diversify their economy. They, they, they've had serious technological problems in even developing and deploying a new generation of of delivery systems. It, it, that, that's yesterday. Oh, yeah, the front. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dolores Burns from Public Citizen. And one of the things we do um, in study is who stands to profit from different situations of power, including the transatlantic free trade agreement, which will help a lot of corporations. <laughs> I could talk to you about that later, T Fish, as you called it. We call it TAFTA. Um, who profits from selling nuclear weapons right now? Are they still being produced, or is there like a used nuclear, you know, gently used market? I mean, is there still money going on in this sector of the economy? Is it, you know, you talk about the choice to go nuclear. What does that entail? Who stands to profit? Um, people aren't selling nuclear weapons to each other. Overtly. Uh, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> we hope. That's right. Um, Russia is engaged on a, a nuclear modernization program, presumably spending lots of rubles on it. Mm -hmm. China is engaged on a, a, a modernization program producing nuclear weapons, uh, increasing its survivable second strike capabilities, and spending yuan on them. Uh, the United States is committed to, but is just starting to commit money to a substantial modernization program of both its complex and of its, uh, uh, the nuclear triad, its strategic capabilities, Estimates run 200 to 250 billion dollars over 10 years for both of those. Now, does 250 billion dollars over 10 years sound like a lot of money? It does on one hand. On the other hand, the annual Defense Department budget is about 586 billion dollars. So there may be money to be made out of nuclear weapons. There's a lot more money to be made out of other kinds of, of weapons at this time in terms of the market. So I don't think that that the profit motive has much to do with why nations want nuclear weapons during this time. I think that uh, uh, nations pursue nuclear weapons because um, of national pride. It's a form of national self-expression. Uh, an Indian diplomat once told a close friend of mine, uh, when asked the question of why does India want a nuclear weapon, they said, well, Great nations have nuclear weapons. India is a great nation. Of course we're going to have a nuclear weapon. The Iranian nationalism is somewhat of the same kind, where you've had 
doesn't matter which elite you belong to, there's a pretty strong national consensus that, um, like India, uh, Iran too, but then Pakistan. Why do they pursue nuclear weapons? Well, they face a conventionally superpower next to them, India. So they're spending a lot of their treasure on nuclear weapons because they want to be able to deter uh, India during that time. So uh, to me, uh, the reason why nations pursue nuclear weapons is not because of the profit motive, but because of how they define themselves as nation and how they define what their core vital interests are. I mean, you know, his, his re remark, though, I mean, may, uh, may, I think it's set up, in my mind, a kind of really interesting uh, argument here, which is, you know, I think, and people have said this before, this isn't original to me, but there are really two reasons that countries get nuclear weapons. They do it either for symbolic prestige reasons to want to be kind of a great power, and I've argued tonight the countries that do that have missed the boat because in today's world, it's your GDP and not the number of warheads you have that make you a great nation. Or you do it because uh, you, you feel, you know, a threat. And as I argue tonight, increasingly countries don't feel those threats, not entirely, because he mentions India and Pakistan, and, but increasingly it's, it's internal threats that, uh, that countries have to address and not external threats. But, you know, your point about TTIP and, you know, who profits, I, you know, one of the great things and sort of where you're coming from, and I'm sorry I have to give an advertisement for TTIP that has nothing to do with nuclear weapons, but where you're coming from, you should be a great supporter of TTIP because we're not, this isn't a trade deal with countries that pay their workers less, that have less regulation, that have envi bad environments. We're talking about the EU here that pay their workers more, that have more strict environmental standards. And what this whole TTIP is about is trying to try to, you know, create commonality in these things. And that is one reason why the unions in this country are not opposing this negotiation. So get on the bandwagon here. Sorry. And then I go. So to, as we reached uh, 740, I want everyone to save their questions because we're all going to be hanging out after this debate uh, just outside. And we're going to close with two short five-minute statements, starting with Ambassador Burt, followed by Clark. Yeah, I don't know how much we really disagreed here. Uh, because, I mean, this was, I think, people who, uh, by two people who, who understand what the role of nuclear weapons has been. And I don't think there's much disagreement there. I do think, though, there are some important changes underway, and we have to take them into account. Clark made the important argument, and it's one that it's, it's non-trivial, and that's the extended deterrence argument. He said, hey, it isn't just that we, you know, the United States is, is, needs to be able to uh, deter an attack, but we have these commitments to other countries. What's interesting to me is over time that argument is increasingly wearing thin. I think, if I'm not mistaken, you, you, uh, Clark, you were involved in the uh, Perry Schlesinger Commission, and the Perry Schlesinger Commission, when it uh, made arguments about maintaining extended deterrence with countries, particularly in Asia, they were refuted by those Asian governments. And and I and I have to say, at Global Zero, we spent a lot of time talking to both the Koreans and the Japanese, and you know, getting the Japanese to endorse nuclear weapons is, is something they're not going to do. But more importantly, I don't want to talk about facts because he'll come back and say, well, no, they didn't really mean that when you're... My, my argument would be that there are different forms of extended deterrence. Having, telling an, a, a third country that you're going to use nuclear weapons to defend them, first of all, I don't think was ever very credible. And Ed If, who I look at, there was always, in, back in the old days, people always, the real question was, would an American president really give up New York to save Paris or to save London? And nobody knew the answer to that question. But there are other forms of extended deterrence, and one is presence. When we have people on the line, that also counts big time.
And I will tell you, the current Polish foreign minister and the Poles feel the Russian threat more, I think, uh, uh, strongly than just about any of the other new members of NATO. Uh, the fo Polish foreign minister said, look, you know, we, we, we just want Americans in Poland. So if something does happen, they're going to get mixed up in this. And that was the, always the argument. We didn't have nuclear weapons in Berlin during the Cold War. There were no nuclear weapons in Berlin, but we had a brigade there. And, we, and, and that reassured the Berliners that if the balloon went up, that Americans were going to get killed. And, and so our presence, I would argue, uh, military exercises, our presence in South Korea, our presence in Japan, our presence, even the military exercises we do with the, with the uh, Baltic states, and the fact that we're going to have a military presence in Poland confers that kind of extended deterrence. So, you know, I, I, I don't think it has to be with nuclear weapons. That just, that argument doesn't resonate uh, uh, with me. And, and you know, I, I, I have, I, I would say that the argument that somehow we need nuclear superiority over China because that offsets their conventional advantages. We never argued that we needed nuclear superiority over the Soviet Union in, in, in Europe. We wanted strategic equivalence. Once the Russians started in the late 60s to build up their ballistic missile programs and into the 70s, we never said that we needed superiority. And that was, and I went through that whole drill, I can tell you, as an academic, as a journalist, and as a government official, and some of you remember we, we changed our doctrine every three years. We went from flexible options and we were reading what General Ogarkov was arguing about how the Russians viewed their nuclear weapons as just another form of long-range artillery and this and that. But the fact is, we wanted general uh, equivalence. The Chinese tell us, and I've spent a lot of time in the last two years talking to the Chinese, they don't want equivalence. They, they have always adopted a strategy of minimum deterrence. And I do think there's a way through, and that the problem isn't the Chinese, it's the Russians. The Russians right now are going through, and I think it has a lot to do with Putin's own domestic politics, where just like Nixon supported the hard hats, he's lost the support of the urban majority in Russia, in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and he's, he's appealing to the blue-collar Russian types and he's doing it by being a nationalist. So he wants to support military forces. Now that wasn't 30 seconds, so you're cheating me. What we have to do is I think if we could get the Russians to agree to go down to 1,000 nuclear weapons, and I believe 1,000 nuclear weapons is enough to deter anybody, that we could get the other, other countries, including China, to cap their programs and we could get in over time into a truly multilateral negotiation on proportional reductions. And that should be our goal. You know, we forget in the 1950s and 60s the idea of any kind of strategic reductions with the Russians was seen as science fiction, as a fantasy. But we did it, and the, um, what we've achieved in terms of verification and transparency with the Russian on their, Russians with their nuclear forces, nobody would thought was possible at this time. So let's, let's kind of ride the wave with Putin. I think, you know, we, we've got a hiatus in the relationship now for domestic Russian political reasons, in my judgment. But then let's try to move towards a multilateral reduction regime that could in terms of this long-term effort, be arguably consistent with our NPT obligations, and the NPT is very important for our interests, and put us on the road, to, arguably, to global zero. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin with uh, expressing my appreciation for Ambassador Burt for being here, and then follow it up immediately with a cheap shot. Um, <laughs> Please, I'm global, used to those. Global Zero put out a report uh, 
in, uh, in May of 2012 uh, by its nuclear commission that was headed up by General Cartwright, and you were a member of that commission. And I just want to point out that in that report, it explicitly said we need more missile defense, more advanced conventional uh, weapons, including a conventional ICBM, to compensate for the reduction in U.S. nuclear weapons. Uh, these are precisely the capabilities, as we pointed out before, that other nations find threatening. They're the capabilities that China, for example, lists in, in answering the question, why are we modernizing our nuclear capabilities? Well, it's the amount of missile defense the United States is doing. It's, it's conventional, prompt global strike, and so on. So we are developing conventional capabilities that other nations view as threatening to their interests and increases their reliance upon nuclear weapons. Um, when well, I we, look- We thought you would like that. <laughs> 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 You're very disarming, sir. <laughs> to me, the issue comes down to feasibility. If a world without nuclear weapons is not feasible for the foreseeable future, why are we adhering to that vision now in a way that keeps us from doing sensible things that could advance our security interests? Um, President Obama, uh, recently gave a speech in Berlin in which he called for a reduction by a third of our operationally deployed warheads, uh, a vision um, that many arms control enthusiasts found disappointing because it wasn't aggressive enough, uh, but nevertheless expressed that. It create, the vision, I would argue, of a world without nuclear weapons is creating what I call the Senator Sessions problem. And what Senator Sessions said was, well, if George Bush had asked to go down to 1,000, that's fine, you know, because that's reasonable. But it's done by a commander in chief who looks at this as a way station down to zero. Well, I can't support it under those kind of conditions. And I would argue that the vision of a global zero is getting to be pr counterproductive as a vision because it's getting in the way politically of doing things that we can do now that might stabilize the number of weapons at lower levels. It's one thing when you have uh, uh, a commitment to a ultimate zero point that most people, many people, would say is not a feasible vision uh, and it's starting to get in the way of the kinds of actions that we could take now. When you lose a Walter Pincus on the vision, you're losing an awful lot of your range of opinion on this. Two more minutes. Uh, I come back again to uh, the fundamental point is that nuclear weapons aren't going away. They're not going to vanish. And as long as nuclear weapons exist, the United States needs to ensure, as President Obama says, that we have a safe, secure, and effective nuclear arsenal and that we treat nuclear issues with the seriousness with which they deserve. Thank you. Let's thank both of the debaters for doing this.